Hello everyone, welcome to MD Media HP Panel. The HP Panel is a weekly Friday show on uh, the Horn of Africa. And we have panelists that uh, provide us with insights on what has been going on over the week and what might come over the coming week. We are live on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, please share, subscribe, like, so that uh, uh, we have more audience than we have already. So the H panel starts now. Great. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure once again to have uh, our weekly uh, panel here. Uh, Yusuf Gabriel Hewart, uh, Faisal Robler from LA, and Professor Liskel Gabisa from uh, Michigan. And um, today we will be talking about the state of the regional states of Ethiopia. And uh, the idea is to talk about uh, where they stand now in terms of the future of Ethiopia. Uh, based on what we discussed a couple of weeks ago on post Abi Ahmed Ethiopia. But as usual, we start with the uh, first question, what uh, stood out for everyone uh, during the past seven days. And it would be great if we can limit it to two to three minutes uh, so that we get uh, the time to discuss the topic of the day, the state of the regional states of Ethiopia. Uh, let, let me start with Professor Eskel Gabisa. Uh, what stood out for you in two to three minutes, past seven days? So what cannot be ignored is the fact that the civil war, the war in Ethiopia is grinding, and the Tigrayan Defense Forces are moving inexorably uh, closer to Addis Ababa. Um, um, and today they have announced that in their northern Shawa, uh, in, in, um, I, th I think taking some strategic uh, places. So it's moving that cannot be ignored. But what stood out for me is this statement uh, in an uh, ET interview, I suspect, uh, that the mayor of Addis Ababa made it. That became a sensation on, on the media that everybody was talking about this week. Uh, for one, it was a trial balloon. I don't think that the mayor of Addis Ababa was uh, ad-libbing. Uh, she was not really um, proffering uh, her own uh, uh, idea. I think it's the party's position. If not the party's position, it is the prime minister's trial balloon. What she suggested was that Tigray, um, if they want to, if Tigray wants to become and independent countries, they could simply invoke their constitutional uh, their constitutional rights and exercise it and become uh, an independent state. What was surprising to me that she, um, she they rejoined there was a rejoinder to that, saying that if that's what they wanted to exercise their constitutional right, uh, Article Thirty Nine to become independent, why did they need to destroy the country? Uh, why did they uh, need to cause that much destruction, human and property damage, uh, something that they could have simply uh, achieved through the constitutional process? Uh, for one, like that statement is significant, and I will be brief about this, that, uh, that um, um, it showed how Abi and his cronies don't really care about uh, Tigray that if they cannot obliterate it, if they cannot, through genocidal war, destroy it from the face of the earth, they're willing to consign them to some kind of an independent existence. Uh, that, that Tigray uh, is not considered part of the country. What we have been saying was confirmed by this attitude, which I think is the position of the prime minister, that that they don't really care about uh, Tigray and Kagaru, and that's what, what we see uh, in Addis as well. I don't think they care about Ethiopia as well. That is really demonstrated in this um, uh, uh, statement. Now, what is interesting for me, why it is significant, is that the foolishness uh, about the statement that 
if Tigray exercised Article 39 and became an independent country, does that mean that the rest of Ethiopia is going to remain together, that the rest of the nations and nationalities who also have uh, this, the, the, this right would not exercise it? And the pronouncement to me suggested that um, in a roundabout way that self-determination out of all of this war, that the right of self-determination up to and including secession has now emerged as uh, the solution to Ethiopia's multidimensional uh, problems. That she didn't mean uh, to say, but that is really what came out to me and that I think is significant. Mm. Great. Uh, um, I, I see uh, Faisal uh, nodding on uh, that note. I saw your Twitter in a reaction to that uh, speech from the mayor, Faisal, where you say, wow, so Oromia and Somali following. So can you speak to that maybe and uh, build on uh, the answer the question of what stood for you? Yes, I think what Scale raised is uh, very important and it's telling of how Abi and team uh, are saying to just use that Amharic uh, phrase, meaning if I can't rule Ethiopia, we will even be willing to destroy it to the point where there is no more beloved Ethiopia that everyone was just uh, in love with it. I think the theme that uh, the mayor of uh, Addis Ababa articulated, and I agree here with the scale, it's not only coming from her, as of uh, it's coming from the top. And this will be a message that we'll be hearing from several regional presidents, including the Somali one, which already started, where they are saying, in a sort of TPLF coming here, we will even consider the possibility of getting out of the existence of Ethiopia. Now, is this really uh, a way to marry the water, so to speak? Or is Abi is giving them the green light to say uh, if TPLF succeeds in the war, then we make sure that we let the union dissipate to the extent possible. So I think maybe I will revisit that issue when we come and talk about the states. But just to conclude my thing and just add to what stood for me, which is also related to this one, is uh, Secretary Anton Blinken is visit to Kenya, and now he's in Abuja in Nigeria, where he talked about the fate of Ethiopia, and he really used the same language that we are just, you know, entertaining right here. He said that Ethiopia is on the, and this is his quote, on the on a path to destruction, on a path. I have never heard a U.S. Secretary uh, for Foreign Affairs saying such a strong, strong language on a sovereign country. Basically, he's saying this after he consulted with all parties and he probably sees that this is an issue that's looming large in Ethiopia. And he continued to square with Abi as the very person who is responsible for what happens in this war. And if Ethiopia is destroyed, the responsibility lies in Ethiopia. And he said, literally in his own words, you are the leader, Mr. Ahmed, Abiy Ahmed, and you are responsible for bringing this war into an end. So if you add that, what Anthony Blinken is saying, and the pending destruction of Ethiopia from the war, and the fact that top leaders at MPP are entertaining to completely let Ethiopia disintegrate at this point in time, maybe, and that's where I got the, the notion of, if you let Tikrai, why can't you let Somalis and Oromos who have had historical historical claim to the issue of self-determination, including an after secession. As a matter of fact, that article was included in the current constitution, primarily to contain OLF, and ONLF at the time. And if you recall, the late Abdul Majid Hussein 
was chairing that panel that drafted that portion of the constitution, basically to show those nations and nationalities who were hitherto oppressed, give them some sort of assurance that the constitution will contain. They are now unpacking that constitution and a lot of people from the Oromo and the Somali would say, so be it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Faisal, uh, for that input. Yusuf, what All right. was uh, line? Yeah. Uh, to me, what stood out was uh, the 11 is our, uh, uh, I would call them panic reactions of various uh, uh, entities uh, uh, triggered by the uh, TDF and OLA. Uh, marching towards Saudi Ababa. Uh, I will mention just three of them. Uh, there are many of them, but uh, just three of them. One is the usual suspect, uh, the uh, International Crisis Group, uh, uh, William Davison, uh, which is uh, uh, the, IC, uh, uh, the ICG group. Uh, uh, he wrote uh, uh, this one on, on his Twitter. Uh, uh, and uh, he said that I uh, understand DC is uh, wavering and divided, so let's prod uh, and plead, but nothing short of U.S. military intervention would prove effective in preventing Tigray leadership from using military power at its disposal to try and achieve goals. It couldn't be as clear, I mean, more clear than this one. Remember last time uh, we talked about how ICG in its last report, uh, 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 it said that do not let the, the go, I mean, the message at that time was do not let Tigray, uh, TDF, uh, reach to the border of Sudan or else, you know, Ethiopia will, uh, uh, will uh, declare the mother of all, of all battles and the whole region will be destabilized. That alarmist tone was meant to, uh, uh, to, was meant to be uh, consumed by uh, the Western ears like uh, USA, EU, uh, and UN. Now it's the same. Uh, it's the same along the same line, but the alarm is that pre prevent TDF from reaching Addis Ababa through whatever means necessary. This is from the international crisis group that uh, 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 pretends uh, neutrality on this on this issue. The other one is, uh, you have heard it, I'm sure, uh, is, a, uh, is a proposal uh, by uh, the seven uh, uh, guys in Atriot, Yared Tobobu, Tamrat Laine, Tetros Asafau, Lidotu, Yalkal, and two others also. And that proposal also was cleverly crafted uh, uh, to deny uh, a political victory to TDF and uh, uh, Ola and its ally, uh, their allies. It was cleverly crafted to make it seem neutral, but uh, it had no neutrality on it. It was a preemptive action uh, to deny uh, that victory. That was also triggered uh, by, uh, uh, by the march to Addis. Uh, but to me, the most interesting one, uh, pr 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 maybe because I'm an Eritrean, was uh, the panic reaction of the Eritrean government also in a very deviant way, uh, which is more or less it fits the, to the frame mind of Shabia. Uh, you have seen probably the list of uh, uh, Tigrayan pilots that has been circulating in the social in the social media. Uh, the news is that Eritrea uh, has been uh, uh, demanding uh, uh, the handover of this uh, uh, of these uh, pilots. Huh? In fact, now they have become 18, I believe, huh? uh, pilots, you know, of uh, fighter jets, bomber jets, and helicopters, huh? uh, that they should be handed over to, to in a typical Sharia way, because uh, it's brutally pragmatic. Sharia is brutally pragmatic. What it is doing right now is it knows that uh, it's, uh, it, has it has come to a conclusion that sooner or later, uh, TDF, Ola, and others will march to Addis Ababa. So it's taking a preemptive action. Uh, I talked about the contingency, you know, the uh, the contingency plan of uh, uh, the Isaias regime. Huh? Uh, it's weakening uh, the, uh, the TDF uh, through attrition 
and through mass starvation in Tigray. Now, along that line, they are ahead, they are playing ahead of the game. What they are saying is, uh, if we cannot get the, you know, they are afraid anyway of the air force, huh? uh, because Eritrea is especially vulnerable to this kind of warfare. Uh, it entirely, it almost entirely depends on the mining companies, and they could easily be targeted by uh, by airplanes and by drones. So once TDF reaches Addis Ababa and acquires those materials, then uh, uh, the only way it could prevent it is by uh, by getting uh, the, the the 18 uh, Tigrayan pilots. So those three uh, reactions stood out for me uh, uh, the last week. Good, thank you, Yosef, and. Um we have uh, improved on our timing in terms of saving for the main uh, topic uh thank you everyone so let's jump in into the topic of the day state of the regional states of uh, ethiopia so of course uh, there are now 10 uh because of the uh, sidama region regional state and we have also the southwest western uh, regional state uh, but we will not cover every uh, every state. Uh, but I think there have been a number of developments there uh, from the Tigray, uh, um, TDF, uh, Ola, and so on. Uh, before we jump in, I just want to play this one also. The Yale uh, Genocide Studies um, had a session this week. And uh, what caught my attention was what uh, Senator uh, Tills had to say about what his view of uh, what's going on. Let me just play this one and we'll jump in. I think I have audio problems. Let me just try one more and otherwise we'll jump in. Okay, yeah, so let's uh, maybe forget that. So uh, uh, le let me start this time with Faisal. So uh, what stood out, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of the topic, what's happening in the Somali state, and you can also talk about the other regions as well. Uh, you are uh, muted, uh, Faisal. What's happening in the Somali region, like any other region, is triggered by what we said, the panic that is taking place in Addis Ababa, and that's also reverberating in the Somali region. For the first time in the last three years, seeing as Mustafa Omar was uh, brought down from Addis Ababa, as you recall, he, uh, for the first time, he has come to public last night, or night before last night, to a Somali-run uh, clubhouse and basically said something that nobody ever expected. Number one, he has distanced himself completely, not only distanced, but disavowed PP. He basically said, we are not, we have no business with PP, Prosperity Party, and there is no factionality between the two, between the Somali region and that party. So that is literally Mustafa washing his hands away and telling Abby and team that we're no longer part of that. The second issue that he raised, in a, as I said, in a three hour long discussion, the other thing that he said, which was uh, uh, you know, a very serious uh, jump for him, was to completely distance himself from the so-called undinat uh, thinking and endorse fully federalism. Basically, he said at a personal level, he has issues with what he called, quote unquote, ethnic federalism, a word that doesn't appear in the constitution as we speak. There is nothing called ethnic federalism in the Ethiopian constitution. There is nations and nationalities and people of Ethiopia who created the current existing federalism, but he's still continuing on his uh, line. And basically said federalism as it exists today is good for Somalis. This is again a huge departure. 
from what he has been saying all along in the last three years, even to a point in the past where he came and denounced the Liu police. Now he's saying Liu police is good. These are forces that we can trust. They are the ones whom we can lean on to in case something happens. So in that meeting, Mustafa completely divorced himself from the, from the thinking that he has been articulating for the last three years. Is this really uh, from his heart? No. I think this is mainly one, that panic. He wa he's expressing all these things as a result of panic. And number two, close uh, sources close to uh, him and other areas are telling me that he is feeling lonely. Now that, as a matter of fact, there was a question, and I will just conclude with this one. There was a question asked by, by one of the listeners who said, why do you always talk about TPLF unlike the other leaders in your own administration who, who don't, you know, so much talk about TPLF? And he said that uh, they have their own way. Uh, so basically, and he said they don't talk because they so choose. Basically, what I'm hearing is that he is finally discovering that he is traveling on a very lonely uh, road by himself. And the more the march to Addis Ababa becomes materialized, the more the panic is hitting. Today, they are looking at, again, uh, sponsoring some sort of uh, all-inclusive Somali gathering, or if you will, conference, to just circumvent what could happen and say, we Somalis, although we oppose TPLF, we are articulating our own issues, including including if it takes to them the issue of secession. So this is a departure for him. Do circumstances forcing him to say this? Is he buying time? Is he, is he trying to be part of the uh, upcoming change, which many Ethiopians believe that there is a change that's coming? We don't know. What we do know is that the panic is hitting home hard, and 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 he's finding the loneliness is not as attractive as it was a few days ago and he's reacting to all this thank you very much yeah uh, so um can we, i ask we... uh, uh faisal uh, yes please uh, what uh, uh, do you think is uh, the opinion of the somali people as opposed to uh, uh i mean uh, the leaders huh? actually Somalis were one of the strongest supporters of Abiy when he came to power, for historical reasons, for all pains that they have felt. That has been dissipated very quickly. If I just come quickly to the answer of your question, overwhelmingly, Somalis have departed from PP. They have also departed from Mustafa. If they had their way, they will settle for a complete independence from the current situation of Ethiopia. That would be the number one choice for Somalis across, even the very ones who are in the in the bosom of his administration. And that's why he's touting the idea of saying, I am coming back home. As a matter of fact, in one of his answers, he said, I am neither Amhara nor Urag. Urag is Gurage. It's a very derogative, derogatory way of putting you know, Urag is, when Somalis say Urag, it's negative. So he used that. Whether he knew that, I don't know. But to your answer, Somalis will prioritize their question and secession or complete independence would be number one. If that is not achievable, they would prefer confederation. And a very strong articulation of Article 9, 39, with self-determination of nations, nationalities, and people of Ethiopia, with guarantees, like Asna, uh, what's her name, the mayor talked about, is the last resort. So the Somali choice is clear. All right. Okay. Great. Uh, uh, I, I like, you know, when you guys uh, intervene and uh, interrupt us, uh, that makes it more uh, of a dialogue. So uh, before I give this to Professor Nesgel, I, I just want to play a very short clip uh, from uh, what happened this week in terms of the World Oromo Congress. 
what do we want to do? What do we want to change? We believe that war has ravaged, or a genocide, genocidal war has been waged, waged against the Oromo, Tigray, Kaiman, Ago, Benishangul, Gomuz, and others. The formula of self-rule in the regions and the uh, shared rule in the center, established by the 1991 settlement, is no longer tenable. The relationship between regions and the center must be redefined after the war, that is. Second, what the war, whether the war ends through a victory of one side or through a negotiated settlement, it is all too clear today that Ethiopia's multifaceted political problems cannot be resolved militarily or militarily alone. The more the Ethiop Ethiopian authorities escalate the war, the greater the certainty of implosion of authority in Finfinni. I think that gives us a, a, a segue into what's happening in Oromia or where we stand in terms of the Oromia regional state. Professor Skel? Oh, I think Oromia is, is restive um, for three years. Uh, or as soon as he came to power, Ali Ahmed assembled his uh, OPDO at the time, maybe the Oromia Prosperity Party today, and, and say that we have to learn from the TPLF. TPLF was able to remain in power in Addis for so long and if we want to remain in power so that we can shape this country and the Oromia region the way we want it, uh, we have to obliterate opp opposition in, in Oromia. That means that the TPLF uh, did not tolerate any opposition in its own region and solidifying its political power base in its own region was able to remain in power in Addis Ababa and Arashkiro for 27 years. So if OPDO were to stay, remain in power, then they have to be more um, uh, authoritarian than the TPLF is what he said, and he did so. Even though the level of violence that was perpetrated against citizens in Oromia varies, uh, the West, the Western part, especially the four regions of Wallaka and Babur to some extent in Jimma. Uh, the southern part had carried the brunt of the fury uh, of Abi Ahmed's uh, reign of terror. It was it economically devastated under the command post? Uh, frisking and searching had to have been turned into uh, business, uh, that is, police officers at various levels. They use the command post and the right to search or the read to search uh, uh, people for economic reasons. Um, the command post itself has devastated uh, the urban economies and the uh, rural economies. So they really suffered. This is simply the economic effect. But in the Western part, uh, even airplanes were used. Uh, to bomb uh, suspected sites uh, of the OLA training camp, as they say, um, but under the pretext that many young people in Oromia uh, support the OLA, families were devastated, um, separated. Even today, they are being killed on, on, on account that, or the ostensible account that um, a member of the family have joined the, o the OLA. So, uh, uh, Oromia had been, uh, in some parts of Oromia, had been uh, really under the devastating uh, rule of violence uh, that Abbey had put in place. But on the, uh, even though they, they thought that they could destroy the OLA in two weeks, it has gained uh, strength over the last three years. But the devastation remains that families are separated, um, 
um, in some places in Romea, if you see in like in Borana and in Bale, there is a famine-like uh, situation. So uh, the, the situation is is um, is really bad in Romea. Uh, on the other hand, they have also um, used uh, uh, the, the, the the diversity within the Oromo uh, nation that they had uh, the fragmentation in Romea, not only the economic devastation, the political and the war, uh, the devastation caused by by war. Oromea is also uh, also fragmented. They have used these psychosocial formations, the differences in psychosocial formation in the Oromo community, pitting one against the other, and they have exacerbated uh, the, uh, the intensified that process today, probably to simply um, make sure that uh, if the Tigray uh, Defense Force uh, marches on Addis and authority breaks uh, in Addis, that they would remain uh, in, in Oromia, that the, the PP believes, or it, its officers, they believe that they could hold on to Oromia. And in order to do that, like just it's happening in, uh, in Somalia, that uh, Mustafa is kind of becoming a, a, a Somali politician advocating for Article 39. The same process uh, is happening in, uh, in Oromia, uh, in the Oromia state government as well. The Oromia PP are now, they're now talking uh, about invoking Article 39, releasing the political prisoners, um, and then uh, uh, standing up to the, the TCLF that this will uh, translate to a political uh, benefit to them. So they, they, after two years, after two years of devastation of the economic and political and, and cultural landscape in and, and human landscape in Oromia, after fragmenting and pitting one group of people against the other in Oromia, after destroying the Kero movement uh, through militarization and, and, and commercialization of um, uh, uh, politics, now, uh, now that uh, the TDF and the OLA are at the doorsteps uh, of uh, Addis Ababa, they are also running away from from the center. All of this, all of this, and I'll say this and I'll stop. All of this, it's not about politics. It's not about Oromia. It's not about Oromos in Oromia or other citizens. OPDO officials, and that's the way I call them, OPDO officials who now call themselves the uh, Prosperity Party, for the last three years, had captured the state and used it for self-aggrandizement uh, uh, and self-enrichment. Nothing like this has happened even uh, under the most corrupt uh, 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 political system in, in Ethiopia. Now, a group of people from a certain group of area, uh, a certain area of Oromia are the richest. They are the ones that are buying up the properties that are confiscated from the Tigrayans. I just heard that someone I know, I've met uh, about two or three years ago, not distinguished by any means uh, as far as his wealth is concerned, was able to buy a construction company uh, for six billion uh, bir, for six billion. Bir. So that is the kind of looting that they had uh, been carrying out for the last three years. There was no governing. There was nothing that was happening in the Oromia region. But they, to keep their loot, they're trying to talk to, uh, they're talking about liberalization uh, in, in Oromia it, to the extent of invoking Article 39 for Oromia. It's an amazing uh, turn of events uh, what's happening in Oromia. But, the most interesting part for me is the Amara region, but okay, I'll come back to that, to that later on. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so maybe before I go to Yosef, uh, uh, that you can uh, comment or when you come back in the next round as well, uh, Professor Esgel. This is uh, uh, one of Can uh, Canada's, you know, uh, largest newspapers, the Globe and Mail. And uh, this article was, I think, yesterday or today. And where this uh, writer is saying that uh, while in power, the TPLF, which was pushed out of office by a popular movement led by Mr. Abi. Uh, so basically, this is presenting, this article is presenting 
Abi as if he was a leader of Cairo uh, and so on. So uh, the reason I'm pointing on this is uh, either internationally, either, you know, the uh, right dose of attention being paid to what's happening or to what Abi has done in Oromia, because uh, my perspective is uh, the fact that he's um, uh, from the former OPDO or Oromia PP, I think uh, is clouding uh, what is going on there. So, uh, I mean, uh, I would be happy if he can uh, uh, reflect on that, uh, maybe when we come back. So, Yosef, uh, before I take the, you know, um, I give you the chance to talk about the topic, I just want to play this short clip. Mr. Nalajo Chilla Madfarna, my Maru, Yetagrai. Uh, this is about uh, Menz and uh, Marhabete uh, North Shore. And this is from uh, the uh, local administration, kind of a declaration on uh, looting and you know taking the loot, not only the weapons, but also the loot from the war. So let's uh, listen to that. Lemelau, Yeshua has yet a lot of Katari came my marrow, yet a gray warari hail, Bamarana, Bafark Luch. ወረ ራፈጽሞ ሰሙኑን ደግሞ ይሃረ ምን ይhail ከኦነክሽኒ የሽብር ቡድን ጋር ጥምረት በመፍጠር በይፋትና በመንዝ ቀጠናዎች ረስተህ ለመንጠቅ ሚስትህና ልጆችን ለመድፈርና ክብርህ ለማዋረድ ወረ ራፈጽሟል ስለሆነም ለረስተህ ለሚስትህ ለልጆችህና ለክብር ሰትል ቀይህ ድረስ የመጣውን ይህንን ይባንዳ ስብስብ እንዳባቶች የተፋልመ ከመንዝና ይፋት ምድር ሳይወጣ እዚያው ቀበረው ታሪክን በክንድ ጻፍ በጀግንነት የማረከው የጦር መሳሪያና ቁሳቁስ የግልህ እንዲሆን ተፈቅዶልሃል ክብርና ሞገስ ለጀግኖቻችን በአማራ ብሔራዊ ክልላዊ መንግስት የሰሜን አስተዳደር ዞን ህዳር 9 2014 ዓ.ም ምህረት ድብረ ብርሃን ኦኬ ያሴ ኦልራይት ኦኬ ዌል uh, this is uh, uh, the pattern that we have been seeing almost in all uh, amhara uh, regions, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Amhara or Redas, let me say, uh, in Wolo, for example, and in uh, uh, Gondar areas. Uh, the pattern has been like this. Uh, how do we turn uh, the war uh, against Tigray into an existential war? That has been the main point. And that is where they have failed. They have tried, for example, uh, when it comes to Tigray, they will tell you this is a war of existence because. Uh, they have come after our women, after our land, after our uh, property, uh, the war of genocide. Therefore, uh, it's Yemunor uh, na Yalemunor, that's how they phrase it. Now, how do you uh, convince the peasants of Amhara uh, that this is an existential war against them, conducted against them? That is where they have failed. Because Wherever the TDF has entered in certain place, of course, there is always this uh, uh, collateral damage that comes as a result of uh, uh, the war itself. So it's not uh, a clean war. There is no such thing as a clean war. But wherever uh, uh, they have entered in the, in, the, in the Amhara region, the peasants didn't feel, haven't felt the threat uh, that, uh, that the Tigrayan peasants felt when the uh, three invaders, for example, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and the Amhara forces uh, uh, entered Tigray. That has been basically the biggest problem that they have been facing. That's why they keep forcing people, uh, sending, for example, uh, these uh, human waves uh, uh, that don't have the will to fight because they don't see it as an existential war. So to me, basically, uh, that's what it is. Uh, but uh, uh, do you have? Do you want to ask a specific question in regard to the uh, uh, to the states, uh, or can yeah, I? Yeah, no, I, I just want you to give uh, because you have the privilege of seeing, okay. you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, all of this. Okay. Yeah. Well, to me, you know, uh, basically, uh, what I'm trying to it's the same question that I have been asking to uh, Faisal. More interesting than what uh, the leaders are thinking. Uh, more interesting than what the elite are thinking. Uh, it's what do the people really think out, out of this, at this point in time? 
what the, for example, Faisal has, give, has given us a clear uh, picture of what the Somalis think, because that will be the determining factor eventually. For example, what do the Oromos uh, uh, really want uh, at this point in time? Which is very, uh, I, I, don't, I don't expect the kind of unanimity uh, that, the, uh, uh, that the Somalis have. Uh, given, I mean, for uh, for various reasons, for historical uh, reasons, and also the fact that the Somalis are probably uh, the most distanced when it comes to Ethiopianness itself. Okay, uh, Oromo, uh, uh, we find it at the heart. In fact, Oromo, I believe, is the heart of Ethiopia right now. Uh, whether, I mean, uh, even though under the, uh, we, we, if we have, if we define it under the old Ethiopia, quote unquote, no, Oromo is not the heart of Ethiopia. It, it has always been Amhara. But in the emerging new Ethiopia, uh, due to uh, geographic uh, and demographic reasons, uh, it, it's Oromo that we find it as the heart of Ethiopia. So to me, it seems that the fate of Ethiopia will be decided by what the people, the Oromo people want. For example, if the people of Oromo uh, uh, the same way the people of Somalia have uh, seems to have, to have decided. If they want, for example, for separation from the rest of Ethiopia, then the entire uh, federal system collapses pre simply by, by, by the virtue of uh, geography. If you look at Oromia, huh? uh, for example, if uh, the southern people, which is a sizable uh, uh, portion of the nation, uh, if the southern people decide that they would like to remain in the federal state of Ethiopia, it would be impossible for them to do if if, uh, if Oromo decides to separate from Ethiopia, simply by the virtue of geography. So, for various reasons, what Oromia decides will be uh, will decide the fate of Ethiopia. That's how I feel. Now, the question is. What do the Oromos feel? To me, it's uh, uh, probably uh, 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 Professor Hinskiel could enlighten us. But to me, it seems it's probably Oromia is probably the most divided eh, in terms of opinion on how to solve this question than uh, Somalia, which is clear cut, than Tigray, uh, precisely because of the genocide that is happening in Tigray has been has been ha has been happening in Tigray. Uh, more or less, you could. You could feel a consensus among the people building up. Uh, they are more or less they are taking the kind of solution that the Somalis are also taking. So you could say that in regard to Tigray. In Amharas also it is clear, although not along the same line. The Amharas, for example, uh, especially the Amhara elite, if you look at them, when it comes to the federal uh, system, uh, it's obvious they hate it. Huh? Uh, if they can. Uh, if they could, they would uh, destroy it, and that's exactly what they have been trying to do. Huh? And uh, if they can't, uh, the kind of federation that they propagate is uh, one that is not uh, uh, along, uh, that's not done along ethnic or linguistic lines, but probably one that uh, uh, along the tech like that lines that used to be uh, before. Uh, uh, that's probably their uh, preference. If if, I mean, if, if everything else uh, fails. So in a sense, there is some kind of unanimity among the Amhara elite, even though it seems that's exactly what is being defeated now. And it's not clear what they are going, what they are going to do uh, after this. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Tigray, though, what do the people of Tigray want uh, is, to me, uh, there is another side of it. The other side of it is, Although there is unanimity, a kind of unanimity building up among the uh, Tigray population, eh? uh, it's not so clear uh, on what the uh, leadership wants to do. Even though, uh, from what uh, from the link that you have sent to us, uh, the link by the uh, Russian, for example, uh, you could see. Uh, one A, B, C, you know, uh, clear cut A, B, C of what you want to do. But these are temporary ones. For example, uh, the idea of compensation, uh, the idea of justice, uh, all of these are things that happen for a one time phenomena, a one time phenomena. The third one is referendum. Uh, 
uh, which is which comes also under uh, uh, self determination uh, uh, but referendum and self determination so to me so vague you know they are more or less processes than the, you don't see the content behind them that's why for example uh, when uh, 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 professor uh, Hiskel gave that uh, speech uh, in the in that congress uh, uh, even though uh, uh, the lady uh, that introduced the, the speech uh, uh, was clear, almost exasperated, you know, she, she kept saying that this time around, uh, we have to make it clear, A, B, and C, what the Oromo people want. Huh? Uh, what I heard from uh, Professor Hiskiel was, of course, the same, almost similar like uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, Debrezian, the process, both of them agree on the process, be it self-determination or referendum, but we don't get the content for various reasons. Hmm? Now, the problem with Tigray, uh, the perennial problem with Tigray is, uh, to me, uh, right now at this, at this particular moment, is that people are confusing independence uh, and uh, uh, to be free of encirclement. This, uh, these two things are not the same. For example, if Tigray gets independent, uh, if, 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 if Tigray separates from Ethiopia, let's say, uh, and then it has its own independence, it, has, it, uh, it creates its own nation. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Tigray will get out of encirclement. It will have Ethiopia on the south, Eritrea on the north, and we will have also uh, Sudan uh, on, uh, on the, in, in the West. Now, can I jump in? Uh, yeah, sure. No, I, I, th I think Getacho, you need to moderate us uh, so that we, 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 we use thrifty on time, if, if I may say so. Oh, I said. Uh, yeah. No, no, no. I mean, you know. So we, I think I have to jump in in about five minutes. So. I think I, I differ with uh, Yosef on, on, on this issue in the sense that uh, I don't think, I think there is the popular history and the real history. I think Oromos are Ethiopia's uh, heartland in terms of political history is, is the popular, the most popular one. I think the reality is different. And this has historical roots as much as the Somali has historical roots, as much as the even Tikre may have historical roots. Begin beginning with uh, uh, you know Ras Ali of Echo when he was when he conquered and became the king of Ethiopia. He was refu they refused to accept him as the Ethiopian king. Even the church refused him. Eighteen something. To the extent that he has Ali, even that to the extent that he said, I am not a Muslim. The name Ali came from somewhere. I'm still a Christian. That train strain of history comes all the way up to the 1940s when Italy invaded that area. And everybody's or every nationality's loyalty was tested to, to, to the king. The Bulcha family, the Maka Bulcha, some of you remember were at the helmet of helping the Italian to establish an Oromo nation state. This is 1930s and 1940s. That history parallels the Somali history who overwhelmingly sided with Italy, not because they liked the white man, but because they saw Italy with the, the possibility of becoming independent from the rest of Ethiopia. I think it's complex. If you take the Oromo, I agree with you, so there may be some division, but if you take the Bale, the Arsi, the Harar, which are which has never been in the in the heart of Ethiopia's social, political, cultural, what have you. So I think it's complex. And I agree with you that the Brazilian and even Getach of Redda uh, presented to us a very not misleading but vague uh, messages through the Twitter of Reda or the Depression in the sense that you don't know whether they want a new Ethiopia where some people are led to have their independence or confederation. They talk about, as you said, incidents. They talk about compensation. 
Redda completely opens the door for maintaining the imperial structure of Ethiopia with some reforms. So I agree with you, there are a lot of lack of clarity around what the dispensation would be. But I, in a way also, I was, uh, I thought the Brazilian was very clear. Come, you know, when did you leave these compensations and lifting the chokehold aside? But he had some road map where he was saying, you know, it would be, the state would be reorganized to a point where you may have different dispensations of statehood. He said that the question is, is he keeping the, the empire intact the same way that EPRDF did last time, or people would be given the choices. I don't think that's still clear. I just want to be short in my present in my response to this. But I have a different take on all this. I think the current existing center and the concept, political concept, that is married to the center as the epitome of power should be destroyed if you want to reorganize Ethiopia. I don't think Tikrains would buy the restructuring of the empire the way EPRDF accepted in the past. Uh, I think uh, I would not be worrying about whether Tikrai would be encircled or not because I hope, Yosef, I hope in the future when we resolve this war and encirclement and choking of one nation against another may not be the political culture of this region, maybe we'll move into a different, uh, you know, uh, dispensation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but geographically, uh, yeah, politically, yeah. 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 I understand that. Uh, no, I understand that. You know, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I don't think uh, Tigray, uh, uh, I think the people wouldn't let it, even if the uh, leadership wants it, you know, it's impossible for uh, from now on. Uh, for Tigray doing what it has, for TPLF doing what it has done before, uh, they are even not willing um, and, uh, to stay uh, for uh, TPLF to stay in Addis Ababa. Most of them, most of the Tigrayans mm -hmm. that I know. Uh, so I think that era is over. But to me, uh, uh, the problem that I am seeing in regard to Tigray is that encirclement phenomena because it has been happening. Uh, it has been a perennial problem. It mm. goes all the way back to Medelik. Uh, mm. uh, that was the time that they sandwiched Tigray between Italian Eritrea and Medelik. Mm. That's how they uh, made it weak uh, uh, for, for, for almost 50 years. And then it happened again in the uh, first way, uh, when again it was sandwiched between Haile uh, Selassie's Ethiopia and uh, British Eritrea, and it goes on and on. Uh, in fact, mm -hmm. in, in, in my last interview that I gave with uh, uh, TV, Tigray TV, I mentioned seven cases where such an encirclement has happened. Mm -hmm. The last mm -hmm. one being the most recent one. Mm -hmm. So you cannot yeah. ignore it. If it happened for 130 years again and again, and mm -hmm. uh, plus remember, uh, if, if, if given a choice, Sudan will side with Eritrea, than with, uh, than with Tigray. So it's mm. a real problem. All that I am saying is encirclement and, and uh, independence doesn't necessarily mean you are free from encirclement. And that okay. question is not being asked by, uh, by the Tigrayan elite or the Tigrayan leadership at this moment. Okay. Thank you, Yosef. Uh, I know. Uh... I'm listening, you know, until everyone is finishing. But uh, Professor Eskel, uh, I think uh, if you want, you can comment on uh, uh, what uh, I was showing before. But uh, uh, I want you, because I you emphasize the fact that this is a roadmap. This is not the roadmap. I think recognizing the diversity of uh, possibilities, all that and so on. So, but, you know, your name has been being mentioned, uh, you know, by Yosef and uh, by uh, Faisal as well. So please. Uh, it's yours now to reflect and, uh, yeah. Well, you know, a lot has been said. I think at the beginning of um, our conversation today, what I said was based on the statement uh, of the speech, the interview that the mayor of Addis Ababa gave that the right of self-determination has emerged as the most important principle that will decide the fate of Ethiopia. And I wasn't joking when I said that. It has emerged. 
you know, academic matters are, or debate about conditionalities or hypotheticals, that's one thing, it's academic. Um, might interest some academics. Here we are talking about reality, human lives. That's what we're really talking about. Does it matter that Tigray would be encircled in the future? How does it even matter that that uh, two militarily powerful states in Africa, Eritrea and Ethiopia, with all of their might, they encircled Tigray? Drones from Emirates, Iran, Turkey, China were used. Everything that any government could throw at Tigray was used, but Tigray broke out of it. And now that the, the one that is encircled and has encircled is the, the prosperity region, regime. Does it really matter what, what we're talking about here that uh, Tigray would be encircled in the north by Eritrea and the south by Ethiopia? Since Tigray is actually really making history that it will defend itself, it has defended itself. It has rewritten military history. So I don't know why that even matters that if Tigray would be uh, uh, encircled in the future. It just doesn't matter. Tigray is fighting a war of survival, and they have shown that they've survived by their own determination without any help. If they have done it today, they will do it in perpetuity through the end of times. So it doesn't matter what will happen. It might be in, in, of interest to academics, but it is not a, an academic matter for Tigray. Same is true with uh, Oromia. What do the people of Oromia want? What do the people of Oromia want? Has, hasn't, haven't we shown in Oromia through the terror movement what we want? The question, the question in Ethiopia, at least under the federal uh, administration, the, the, the federal administration, when we thought the 1991 political settlement was sufficient for the Oromo people to continue to live within Ethiopia in association with other nations and nationalities according to the 1991 settlement and the 1995 constitution as co-sovereign units with the federal government. That's what I was saying earlier, that the principle of self-rule in our region, in our regions, so to speak, and, and, and shared rule in Addis Ababa, even that is broken. The only way that you can reshape Ethiopia is through the exercise of our, our democratic right. The Kero movement made it clear the Oromo demand is called a babiyuma. We call it the Inafan Oromo, it's called a babiyuma. What it simply means is politically self-rule without any interference. Any federal power would be determined by law to federal uh, uh, prerogatives. But Oromia will be ruling itself. Oromia would decide on, or the people of Oromo or residents in Oromia will decide on economic issues that the Oromo people also decide their own identity. It's only simple, so simple, that we wanted self-rule, we wanted economic justice, and we wanted determination of our cultural identity. And people still ask, what do Oromo or, 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 or want? We no, it. Uh, I, I'm not, wait, wait I'm not saying it's... I, I listen, it's, okay, I listen uh, very yeah, carefully. Go ahead, go ahead, okay. It's, not, right. it's, not, it's not about... Yeah, 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 it's I'm, okay, it's I'm okay. Saying, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but look, what do Oromos want? What Oromos want will be known only when they have exercised their right to self-determination. Whether they want to remain in Ethiopia, whether they want to become an independent republic or any other form of association with, with uh, others, that will be known, known when they exercise the right of self-determination. I'm glad that you, it was raised earlier that what we expressed in the roadmap in, 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 in a roadmap, what we expressed, a simultaneous process uh, of reforming the state at the, both the regional level and the federal uh, level, that will determine the transition uh, towards some kind of um, association with others. 
That's exactly what the president of Tigray said, uh, President uh, uh, de Brazil. What will decide in the future? What will decide is, is, is the formula of that people make a determination. They, they determine, the self determines the future. That's what's going to happen. Uh, but you asked me, uh, Dr. Gedacho, on what we, what we saw uh, in Northern Shawa. Very, very interesting. The call, it really emanates from the deep recesses of Ethiopian history, where the, the national army, where there was no national army, Menelik or other uh, emperors in Ethiopia uh, call on the, uh, mobilize their own nation, and they say, you bring your own um, uh, supplies, you bring your own uh, uh, weapons, and everything that you um, uh, capture would be your loot. I thought that Ethiopia has changed, that the Ethiopian state has changed. Now the Ethiopian state had completely obliterated the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. It has gone back to its medieval roots. And what you see in that, in that uh, clip is the mendacity, the, the, the rot, the viciousness, the, the lassitude, the, the ignorance of the Ethiopian state. It had shown the true nature of the Ethiopian state, which as Faisal said, should never be allowed to continue as it is. If there is an Ethiopia to be uh, in, that er in that era, it will be an Ethiopia that was made, but if it's a federation, it will be a federation of the willing, but Ethiopia that was made through the choice of its constituent parts. Otherwise, when, when, when this kind of medieval thinking comes to the surface, who wants to live in the 21st century in an, in a, in an ethos and, and thinking that is governed by um, medieval uh, ideas. This is what it is. This is what we did not like about Ethiopia, that you, a, a state would say that this religion of states would say, kill and whatever you capture, keep. The, the amazing thing about this is that the prime minister of Ethiopia at one time when they changed uh, the currency said exactly the same. Anything beyond 1.5 million would be confiscated, and what would be confiscated would be used by the Ethiopian National Defense Forces to uh, on their on them uh, to reform themselves. That's the, the mindset, and nobody wants to live under this kind of mindset. Nobody should live under that mindset, and that is simply a demonstration of of the ruthlessness of the Ethiopian state, the true nature of Ethiopian state. Can, can I add one thing? Then Joseph can probably have it uh, yeah. to. I think Scale expressed something that was inside me, and I probably tweeted. And I think uh, some time ago, I think the people of Tigray broke the biggest encirclement, if not in human history, at least as far as I know, in the history of the continent, as well as in the history of. Middle Eastern and Northeast, what we call geographically Northeast regions. There is nothing in the future that would frighten the people of Tigray, whether Eritrea, Sudan, and Ethiopia and Somalia come together to suppress the spirit of that people. Perhaps, and I would be rhetorical here, perhaps. What the people of Tigray, and we're not talking about TPLF, we're talking about the people of Tigray. What the people of Tigray did as a lesson to humanity in terms of how the spirit reacts to an oppression and subjugation if and when the people have the right leader and the right strategy at heart. Having said that, I think TDF and its leadership and Ola should not miss this opportunity to restructure Ethiopia slash the Horn of Africa in a way that politics is no longer a means to oppress, but an end to oppression. There is a chance that we can reorient the center of power from what it had been in the last hundred years to a new center 
that is both geographically as well as politically in the belly of Ethiopia. Perhaps the role of Oromia should be enhanced and become clearer to, if you will, take the leadership to rearrange Ethiopia in a way where self-determination, confederation, and even independence is discussed at an open platform that includes Tikrai, Somalis, Oromo, and everybody. I think this is an opportunity, as Scale said, the willingness of the spirit to be together is the most powerful proposition people that who have different cultures can have as a light to guide them to a future. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, Yosef, uh, reflect yeah. on that and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I will yeah, go yeah. to the final one. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. all right. Uh, uh, to, to go back to the encirclement problem, uh, it has not been always the case that Tigray won uh, in every encirclement. In the first Wayani, when 20,000 Tigrayans rose against the, uh, the Haile Selassie rule, in the end they failed. And they paid for that uh, for tens of years, uh, for, for uh, decades, I mean. Uh, and now uh, we are talking about victory, but what kind of price has Tigray been paying to, to get out of this? You know, we are only looking at the, uh, at the miraculous part of it, you know. How many people uh, are dying, for example, uh, in this war uh, on the Tigray side? We don't know. Huh? How many people are dying because of, uh, of this encirclement in uh, starvation because uh, they haven't got uh, the, uh, the right medicine uh, because uh, the, uh, there is no medicine in, in Tigray. Uh, probably thousands of people are dying. Uh, one of the, oppos the opposition groups have put the, the number of uh, massacred in Tigray uh, around 51,000, most of them men. I know this case in, Eritrea, in the case of Eritrea, when uh, the Eritrean revolution came to an end successfully, there were hundreds of thousands of women eh, that ended up being spinsters for the rest of their lifetime because they couldn't find mates that, that could marry them. There was a disproportionate uh, the demography. There were fewer males and uh, many males, I mean, uh, uh, many females that couldn't find any husbands and that have uh, lived for uh, the rest of their lives without being married. The, uh, the, in Eritrea, for example, one of the reasons why Eritrea has now small population is precisely because of the demographic effect that came beginning from the uh, 30 years war. So in, in Tigray, the destruction of the economy, the destruction, uh, uh, I mean, the number of deaths and all of that will have probably, it has set it back 20, 20 years. I'm pointing all of these negative things because every time it gets encircled, even if it miraculously gets out of that encirclement, it is, it's paying a huge price. It's not simply, you know, uh, we are talking about this miracle, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that this will go on forever. So the idea of encirclement in Tigray is real. So one has to think about it. I don't mean that uh, in independence is part of the solution. I know that because it will have its own army. But still, you know, one has to think, how do I get out of this encirclement problem? How do I solve it in a permanent way rather than uh, waiting for it to happen again and again? The other one that uh, Faisal, uh, uh, I mean, that uh, uh, Professor Hinskel has mentioned about the self-determination, I understand that. But I was expecting a more particular case. Like, for example, when I asked Faisal, he didn't stop at the self-determination part. He told me the kind of consensus that exists among the people, among the many choices that the self-determination gives to you. So and you be feeling the heart of uh, the Oromo people. Eh? I'm not saying, uh, I mean, pull it out of, uh, you know, uh, uh, magic. All that I'm saying is, since you know the, the beat of the Oromo people, you probably could give us a more a precise answer. The way Faisal said, for example, he said that 
given uh, whatever it is, uh, the, the, the past among the Somali people, uh, I know for sure that their first choice would be independence, their second choice would be confederation, their third point. I, I, that's the kind of uh, 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 answer that I'm expecting. But anyway, uh, it's okay. Uh, so the, we have gone, uh, I mean, we ha I have taken it too much a long time. So let's go to the uh, closing mm -hmm. remarks. Okay, great. Uh, I like, you know, actually the uh, heat uh, because uh, when there is debate, there is, you know, back and forth. Uh, that's how we uh, get more insights from you guys. So uh, final words uh, for the day. Uh, this time, let me start with uh, Yosef and then uh, I will go the other way around. Yosef, what's your final word for today? Oh, well, uh, uh, I'm expecting, you know, uh, 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 again, uh, what uh, the panic reactions of, uh, of uh, uh, many uh, organizations will be as uh, uh, the forces of uh, Tigray uh, and Ola get closer and closer to uh, Addis Ababa. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, the one that I told you about, uh, uh, the reaction by the... By the uh, uh, by the guys in uh, in, uh, in Riot, uh, which came out with a certain kind of proposal uh, uh, to blunt, you know, uh, that kind of victory. So I'm expecting various sources, especially those powerful ones like the U.S. Uh, uh, now it's only t all, all that we have, we are hearing is uh, panic terms. So would they, for example, propose? Uh, would the U.N. propose? Uh, a military intervention, for example, uh, that would be uh, the most interesting uh, uh, phenomena to see in the coming uh, in the coming weeks. As peacekeepers, I'm saying, as peacekeepers. Yeah. Mm. Great, thank you, uh, Faisal. Yes, I think uh, for me, what is important is the fact that the panic, again, to go back to our subject, is introducing or bringing with it a lot of options. And one of the options in the Somali region is the spectrum that uh, a regime change could happen with or without the Abiy government coming going down. We don't expect it to survive, but even if it survives, there has to be a change. The panic is bringing about a lot of forces to the surface that would play a significant role in the upcoming change. ONLF, so my Ogaden National Liberation Front, has taken strides in the last few days to lobby with the U.S. Congress and the U.S. State Department to bring attention of the West to its oil vis-a-vis -vis China and they have gotten very favorable ears in Washington, D.C. There is also the Somali uh, Liberation Front, which is in the throes of agreeing and signing with the nine groups that have assembled recently in uh, Washington, D.C., where that will grow, we don't know. Then there is a consortium of intellectuals and former civil uh, servants who are now gathering around the world and will be producing their own action plan. I would expect that to happen very soon and show willingness to work with TDF and OLA for a potential political change in, in Ethiopia. Let me just say that I think uh, uh, we should, as a region, Horn of Africa, and that's the panelist's name, we should not rule out a potential coming together in the future after this war is, you know, uh, finished. And if and when some of the autocratic rulers in the region, i.e. Isaias, for that matter, Abiy, leave the political scene, there could be a reconciliation point between regional cooperation, regional unanimity, on the one hand, and self-determination uh, for people to exercise. Farmacho, Isaias, and Abi tried to fudge 
uh, hastily put together regional cooperation, if you will, regional, you know, coming together. What they have not addressed was the underpinning political historical question is that is in Ethiopia. It was easy in Somalia, it was easy in Eritrea, but the challenge was, and for that matter, Djibouti, the challenge was in Ethiopia. And some of us commented on that early, that Ethiopia cannot federate or unite with any regional power until and unless it addresses its issues internally. I think with the TDF, Ola, and others moving to Addis, I fully endorse the two stage the two stage proposal that Deborah Sion put together, the the, the transitional and I think uh, what was it uh, the two government systems that can move from one to another to establish the right platform and format to start the deliberation and discussion of what could happen about Ethiopia, i.e., independence to some groups, confederation, or a very loose self determination where the center is completely weakened at the expense of the regions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Faisal. Uh, Prof, uh, you will continue, and uh, I like the way you, because when I heard that uh, Northern Shua local administration, you know, declaration, uh, it took me back, you know, where are we, you know, in which century are we? So from the choice of the word, to the tone, to the message, everything was, uh, exactly what you were reflecting on. So your final word, Professor Scare. Um, yeah, we talked about the, the, the regional states. When it comes to the solution about the future, uh, we talked about the regional states where actually what they want is clear. There is the elephant in the room and that is the Amhara region that we did not talk about. So uh, briefly, I just want to talk about that. Like, look, the civil war for the central government or the federal government for Abi was a war of restoration, war of restoration of the system, the imperial system, the centralized system, was a war to restore the past. For the Amhara region, it was a, a war of reclaiming land. They wanted more land, whether that is the Amhara people or the Amhara or people who call themselves Amhara from Addis Ababa, but business people, interest groups. It was a war for land. The Amhara, the Amhara region went for the jugular. They wanted more land and they ended up losing, losing more land right now uh, to Tigray. Uh, they wanted uh, Raya and uh, Orkait. Now they have lost to t the Tigray Defense Forces. Uh, the land all the way from the borders of Tigray to, to Shawa and uh, Wakhimra, Oromo, Oromia zone, these are all gone. And some parts of the Gondor uh, zones are also gone. So they they went to find the, uh, to, to gain more land and they end, they end up losing uh, land. Second, they lost the political war. They lost the war, uh, uh, polit politically speaking. That is, they wanted to reinstate Amhara uh, leadership in, in, in Ethiopia. And now that what we see is the notion that uh, the Amhara could cast the Ethiopian uh, state uh, in their own image has, has been uh, completely decimated. It doesn't exist. Right now, what the proposal is for the Amhara region is not that it would probably be um, again a dominant force in Ethiopian politics. The state itself, the Amara regional state, they cannot even keep that because there are oppositions right now in the Amara region, regionally and politically, that it is really uh, breaking up, so to speak, in the Amara region itself. And, and finally, they, um, they, uh, they lost the war, lost the war uh, that they attempted, that the Amhara, the Amhara uh, elite in Addis, the territorial Amhara, the deterritorialized de Amhara, as Severe Chernistov calls them, and the territorial Amhara in Bahrnar and Gondar, they lost this war. They had an opportunity to reshape Ethiopia when they had all the powers and the military prowess that the Ethiopian state had, 
the, the Eritrean state had, the technology and uh, financial support from, from uh, across the Red Sea, they had that. What they could not have won at that time, they will never win. They will never win. So what is being buried today as a result of um, as a result of the, the loss of war is the fact that the Amhara regional state itself is going to be the scene of warlords in the future. That's what it's, good, it's going to be. The rest of Ethiopia, they don't have any problems with the 1991 settlement, even though that is really needs to be renegotiated. What President de Brazil said and what uh, we proposed in our uh, roadmap it's not just the simultaneous process of, of transition in the regions in the center. It is also staggered. It's, also, it's not just concurrent. It's also in tandem. What that means is that in order to avoid a political vacuum, there will be an interim government, a provisional or an interim government. That would continue state functions for up to six months, but then there will be transitional government, which comes out of the discussion of the national dialogue, that will write the charter for the transitional period. At least that's the plan. In all of this, what is important is that the right of self-determination, so, we, we, so that we do not shape for them, saying this is federation, confederation, or, or, or um, uh, um, some other forms of association, should not be decided by anybody else but than the self. So that will be the bedrock principle that is inviolable and not derogable. Uh, we will we will find out um, uh, next week what where the the war stands and when the where the politics actually stands. Maybe uh, by the end of next week. Uh, thank you so much. Um, that was the show for today. HP panel. Uh, each panel would be coming back again uh, next week and uh, we will follow the developments on the ground uh, we will uh, follow what the international community is saying among other things i just want to try again to play what uh, yale uh, genocide studies program uh, hosted this week edge what can the us do to further place pressure on both sides of this conflict to end the obstacles that have been placed to slow stop the transport of vital aid and i know we've spoken a little bit about this but he specifically wants to know what can the senate do and what should the administration be doing right now well i think it goes back thanks for the question there i think it goes back to what I said earlier, moving legislation out of both chambers of Congress is very important, impactful. The plain letter of the legislation will provide the president with additional tools. Um, but I think we send a message to Ethiopia and to many of our partners and allies that we all have to marshal resources. But just think about how bad the situation in Ethiopia must be to prompt the leader of that nation to limit access. He's obviously weaponized food and water. Um, but I, I've got to imagine that most of what we're talking about is understated. If it's not, then why would the prime minister have any problem with letting the press come in, letting NGOs come in, uh, make it clear that he's not starving people to death as a strategy of war? So I think we have to talk in these blunt terms. Uh, I think that um, Senator Coons is a little bit more diplomatic than I am, but, I, uh, but he also speaks in strong terms with respect to Ethiopia. But I think we have to speak truth to the world population and, and do everything that we can and use every device, like I said earlier, diplomatic and economic, to bring pressure on that administration to help us help the people of Ethiopia. That is the final word from the MD Media for this H panel uh, episode. And uh, thank you very much for your time, Professor Esquel Gapisa from Michigan, Faisal Robla, and Yosef Garewat from LA. And I will hope, I hope to see you next week. Thank you for your time for today. Thank you. You have been following uh, UMD Media's HP panel, uh, H panel. Uh, and uh, today we discussed the state of the regional states of Ethiopia and we'll come back next week with another episode of the H panel. And uh, please uh, share, subscribe and um, like so that many uh, can access this material so that we have more audience. 
and we'll be also between now and Friday, we'll be uh, coming with another show, the HP panel, signs off. <laughs>